Thank you. Welcome, uh, welcome to Inro. Our guest tonight is an active publisher and advocate of songwriters' rights for over 20 years. Uh, she's the vice president of Shapiro, Bernstein & Co., and uh, one of America's oldest independent publishing companies, whose catalogue contains some of the world's most enduring classics and modern-day hits. Debbie oversees all as aspects of the company, including creative, royalty, copyright, licensing, business affairs, international, and prior to joining the company, she was a music supervisor, independent publisher, and spent many years as director of member relations at ASCAP. She currently sits on the committee at MCPS, PRS, and is a long-time board of director of the Association of Independent Music Publishers in New York. Now, Debbie, that's quite a CV. Um, how did you start? How did you get first get into the industry? And what got attracted you to it? Oh, a very good question. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. 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 Um, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I started as a journalist. Um, and really, I, I, I w it was because I was an obnoxious, precocious child. But um, I grew up in Los Angeles. And uh, I, they used to, I don't know if you have something similar here, maybe you do. But they had a, a rotary club where if you, as a high school student, would give a speech to the Rotary Club, they would give you like a hundred dollar scholarship towards your college education. So I was like, sign me up, I'll, I'll mm. chat about anything. And uh, so I went and I gave my talk and stayed for their chicken dinner. And, uh, and I was sitting next to this man and we were speaking and, you know, I asked, you know, where he worked because, you know, obviously he's a local businessman. And he said, oh, the Daily News. And I went, oh. It's like, what? What's wrong with the Daily News? Well, at the time, there was three major newspapers in Los Angeles, The Times, The News, and The Herald Examiner. And I said, we subscribe to The Daily News, and there's one music writer, and all he ever writes about is the new Bruce Springsteen track. You know, there's so much music going on right now in LA. There's, you know, this whole scene of, you know, the circle jerks and the flying lizard and all these, like, punk movement that was happening in LA that's never, ever covered in that newspaper, and I just find it annoying. He was like, well, you know, you said you were the editor of the high school paper. I'm like, yes. He's like, and you write? I'm like, I do. He's like, will you submit some samples to me? And I said, all right. He gives me his card, and it said that he was a publisher, editor-in-chief. And I'm like, oh, now I'm mortified that I was insulting this man's paper. Uh, but he hired me to write about local music. So I was quite young and, at the time, probably not allowed in the bars. Um, covering the music scene in LA back in the late 70s. So how would you get from there to music? Oh, place? that's a great, that's a, once again, it's a very circuitous route. You know, I just basically, and this is something I advocate to everybody, take every opportunity, because you never know which one is going to be the road that you're going to be on. Um, I basically took every opportunity that walked through my door, and I worked in radio, I worked in management, I worked in promotion, um, I worked in music video, and, Ultimately, I moved to New York. I was very poor, I had no money, um, and I lived eight blocks away from ASCAP, and I used to walk by there every day. And, um, and it dawned on me, it's like, wait a second, not only do you know what they do, because I had managed bands and met with both societies, I'm like, oh, join ASCAP, but you believe in what they do, go in there and ask them for a job. And so I walked in off the street, and three months and five interviews later, they gave me a gig, and that's when I became a writer, publisher, advocate, you know, and that kind of changed. I never foresaw that I'd be a music publisher. I didn't even know what a music publisher was. Well, that's a very but good point. Is, there, is everybody fully aware of what music publishing is? Do you, want, I mean, do you want to just give us the kind of the Oh, nuts sure. And bolts? Well, you know, I mean, a music publisher, and I really, like, I do old school publishing. I am not a multinational, I'm not a major publisher. Um, I'm, I'm an old school music publisher whose job one is to protect the rights of the songwriters and enhance their career so that they can have a career writing songs. Um, and that is, in essence, all I do. And so, on this trip I'm doing right now through Europe, I'm sitting down at 11 different societies to go through like very tedious, like, okay, this guy's name is spelled wrong and that's not his IPI number and he's not getting his money, to, you know, sitting down with A&R people and saying, all right, let me hear what you're doing and let me play you some tracks that I think might work for your project. Um, but it, it's, it's very much um, an advocacy role and it's also, you know, like I said, it's, it's a protection role. I mean, it's impossible as a songwriter, unfortunately, 
for you to take care of your own business worldwide yourself. Um, you know, if I didn't have a enormous team around the world, I could hardly do it. And in many countries, I can't do it. You know, I, I'd still like to know how to collect a dime out of India. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's something that, that this is all of our focus is just doing the business of, you know, of the songs. And, um, you know, and I just kind of have this expectation for my writers, just, just give me really good songs to work with. And, you know, and then it'll all come into play. And you mentioned the business of it there. I mean, do you think that kind of artists and, and acts <coughs> fully understand how important it is? Because you know, if people get into music for the you know the buzz of making music. They don't. They're not always interested in the business side of things. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think that. I, I mean, w once again, I think you need to be savvy enough about your business to know that there is a business and it is a business. That you know, um, you can absolutely be a songwriter musician as a hobbyist and because it's your love and it's what's in your heart and nothing makes you happier than pulling out your guitar and playing and that is fine but if this is going to be your vocation as well as your avocation you know you you do <coughs> need to think a little bit about your business and realize that it just doesn't magically happen you know as 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 wonderful as an organization as imro is it's impossible like you need more than your society on your side to if you have music that is available worldwide. Now, if you just have music available locally, you kind of can't do it. I mean, I tell American songwriters that all the time. It's like, listen, if, if your stuff is just really local to what you're doing, you, you can kind of do it. But once it, you know, once you need a passport, you, you need somebody else on your side to help you with it. And so just the pub, your angle, does that handle live side as well? Or is it purely recorded? Well, you know, it's it's funny because it's everything. I mean, Shapiro Bernstein is almost a hundred years old. So, uh, you know, back we look, you know, all the way back to the roots when there was no recorded music, and when yeah. you know it was just about selling sheet music. Um, you know, and before there was radio, and before there was television, before there were video games, and every way now to make money making music. Um, but uh, but it's you know it's 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 looking after everything. You know, it's. I mean, I, I sit on the songwriters all the time going, great, you're on tour, I need a set list and I need you know, information mm. from every place you play. And I, so it, it's looking after their live performance as well as recorded performance, as well as you know, tracking down if they have something. In a, you know, in, I, I just saw that they were selling the CSI box set in Lisbon. I'm like, okay, I've got eight songs in that season of CSI. I guess mm. I need to make sure that you know, I'm getting the DVD money for that. You know, it, it's all of it. I mean, you said, you know, the company's been going 100 years. I mean, things are changing so fast. Is it hard for you to kind of, kind of, I mean, how, how things, say, in the last 10 years, how have you? What, what things have, you have changed dramatically in the past 10 years. But, you know, I mean, we laugh just internally all the time about how no, long, no matter how long we have done this, Every day we come across a situation that we haven't dealt with before, which is what keeps it interesting. I mean, frankly, if we were doing the same thing every day, you know, I would just, be, I, it wouldn't be exciting at all. Um, but, you know, to some <coughs> degree, at the core, everything remains the same. It's just about getting music <coughs> out so that people can enjoy it, mm -hmm. and then getting, you know, monetizing it in so that songwriters can make a living. You know, I mean, that's, that's really all we're trying to do. Um, you know, having new revenue streams. I mean, we approached Hallmark a number of years ago um, because we, and we work with a wonderful old lyricist named Dorothy Fields who wrote songs like The Way You Look Tonight and On the Sunny Side of the Street. We were looking at like these classic lyrics going, you know, this would be really good for a line of greeting cards. And we contacted Hallmark and they said, you know, we're thinking of doing like music playing inside the greeting cards. And it's a like, great, and that, you know, forged a relationship um, that, that we still enjoy that, you know, 15 years ago, we would have never thought about that, you know, chips could be so small that they would actually play a master inside of a greeting card. Um, but yeah, so it's, 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 it's fascinating. You know, I really look forward to, you know, something has to shake down. You know, music can't be for free for always. I mean, we're, we're in a really, really rough mm. patch right now. But so I mean, it, it seems to be so hard for people to make a living for music. I mean, it, if you look at the rap companies, I think they, they've seen all these new things as 
an, a kind of an unknown territory. I mean, as publishers, do you look at these different areas and think that's, a, that's actually an opportunity rather than a problem? Well, you know, I, I, th I think as publishers, we always look at everything as opportunities. It's just, okay, how do you make the opportunity make sense? And that's, and that's what it is, you know? I mean, the price for music is not nothing, but, you know, the price also has to be within the means of people to access it. So, you know, so it's, it's always doing that kind of, of juggle and, you know, I mean, even w we often work with really small, you know, independent filmmakers who are making films on a shoestring and just because they're making a small film doesn't mean that, you know, they should not have great music to help their vision along of what they're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, we'll tailor agreements, you know, on a, on a stepped basis so that they can afford our songs, you know, and use a ring of fire, you know, because that's what their dream is. And that if their film ends up becoming a big worldwide blockbuster, at the end of the day, we'll get what we would have gotten had we done an outright deal, but instead we'll do it so that they can afford it and use the music and, and work with them. And I think that's a lot of publishers, like, you know, are going to work with people and not against them you know we like to close a deal and do you get a sense that kind of music is losing its worth to certain people to certainly to consumers who are, are so used to getting things for nothing now well, I don't think it's losing its worth I mean you know I, I, I can't speak for everywhere but you know in New York City it used to be that you got on the subway and everybody on the subway had a book or a newspaper and now I'd say three quarters of the people on the subway have headphones on, you know. So if anything, there's more, like music is more important than ever to people's everyday experience. Um, and it's easier to get and it's easier to access. Um, it's just a matter of trying to figure out how to come up with the correct, you know, payment scheme to then, you know, make sure that the songwriters can keep writing it. And is the concept of the song still important? I mean, you know, with everything that goes around, you know, with bloggers and with, you know, websites and, you know, and the videos, is the actual song at the heart of it, do you think that's still as important I, I, as ever? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a publisher, so I'm, I'm, I'm partial to the song. But, um, you know, I, I think the song is absolutely the key because it really doesn't matter. I mean, if you go onto our website, you can listen to... I don't know, probably 60, 80 different versions of Ring of Fire, mm. you know? And the Johnny Car Cash version has no bearing on the social distortion version, which has nothing to do with the wall of voodoo, which has nothing to, like everybody takes the song and if it is something that is just a great song, you're, you know, the interpretation can be anything. So, you know, I'm always happy that people cut and recut and recut, you know, the, the, the catalog. So do you think, do you, do you find out with covers, are you happy for stuff to be covered all the time? Absolutely. You don't think there's a, a in the, what's, what's, is there a like percentage you can't change or there's some? Well, I mean, they can't rewrite write the lyric without yeah. permission. They can't, I mean, there's, you know, but, but basically if you, do, if you just, you know, do your take on it, that's, that's, you know, as, as long as the songwriter gets the full credit, you're fine. And how much say does the song, and once you, you have, you have the publishing rights to that song, how much say would the songwriter have over another version of their song? None. None at all? None. Um, well, in the United States, there's a compulsory license. So once it's been recorded once, anybody in the world can record the song. Um, they can't change it, but they can record it. So, um, so they have no say. And, and like I said, and there's some horrible versions of, of, I mean, there's nothing worse than, you know, Bob Dylan or Olivia Newton-John or, you know, Billy Bob Thornton's, I mean, there's some terrible versions, don't get me wrong, yeah. but, but it's always great that people just feel so strongly that they want to do it themselves, you know, and I think as songwriters, that's your goal. You want to write a song that everybody in the world is singing, that everybody in the world wants to sing. And so what do you think, make of kind of X Factor and all these shows where, you know, these, these songs just get churned through? Oh, uh, well, week? you know, um... As a publisher, I think that um, all music shows are good music shows because, you know, it's always nice to get the extra, you know, royalties yeah. and get the extra exposure from having your songs in these kinds of shows. Um, I'm not a, personally, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big um, fan of shows like that because I think they are great for... Um, 
showcasing a really good singer or a really good karaoke singer, but they're not particularly good about showing a new artist. And, and I think that, you know, the artistry is, is really what makes somebody a staying, you know, entity in the business, not just somebody who can sing a country song or an R&B song or this or that. I mean, I, I, I just don't really, I just don't see them, which is in the United States, we don't have a history of people who are idle winners becoming long-term successes. Um, because it's just, you know, it, it would be different if it, if it was a contest where you were just being you and presenting yourself time after time. But yeah, when in that chameleon role, I think it's, it's, it's a little odd to me. Okay, I think, so we have kind of a, a room full of songwriters, I guess, here. Um, how should a new artist approach a publisher? What, how, what's the best way to present them, sir? Oh, all right. Um, well... I think it's I think it's important as a songwriter, songwriter artist, and I always speak in terms of songwriters just because you might perform your own songs and you might not, and it's one and the same to me. Um, it's very important to know who <coughs> you are and have your stuff together. You know, present one or two songs that are undeniably you and really finished and that you feel really, really proud of. You know, um, never take that opportunity to say, well, yeah, I should have sent you something else instead. It's like, d use your opportunity as, you know, push forth. And if you're not ready to, if you don't think it's ready, if you're not happy with the production, if whatever the thing is, if there's something nagging you about it, don't do it. Wait until you're like, I am so proud of this. I, I need to share this with you. Um, I also, you know, a lot of times when people send solicitations, they're just like, hi, I'm working on this great new prod. And it's like, no, don't send me a hi that you're sending to everybody as a mass mailing. You know, take your time to research who you're sending the information to and send it to the right person. If you are a country songwriter, don't send your stuff to somebody who, you know, signs a lot of rock acts. They're not gonna care. You know, if you are a R&B writer, don't send it to the pop division. You know, it's like figure out, look at the records that you really like, you know, things that you think have been really well done. Read the credits, you know, they're all on there. The names will be there. They'll thank their publisher, they'll thank their A&R guy, they'll thank their attorney. Okay, here on one piece of paper that you love, you have three good names of things that you're like, you know what, I want to be like this, and these are people who appreciate that. Let me start, target who you send your information to, your stuff to, because, you know, if, you might send it to my colleague and he might say, I don't get this. And I might listen going, yeah, but it's brilliant. You know, it's because you have your, 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 your way too dance to appreciate, you know, something like this. Mm -hmm. So send your stuff to the right people, research who you're sending it to and make it personal, you know, right. You know, dear Debbie, I love what you did with this record. You know, can you take a listen to this one song of mine? I'd really appreciate your feedback. Just be short, <laughs> be polite, send something that you're really proud of. And, um, you know, and then listen when people respond. Well, I think it's the same approaching all aspects of the entry, isn't it? I mean, you know, as an as a editor, we get sensing. I was doing the Hard Working Class Heroes, which is a kind of a convention over here. Yeah. And there was kind of speed sessions, and people turned up, and they, did, you know, they pulled up a CD with a broken box out of their bag, and they didn't have a card. And you only kind of get one chance to make that first impression, don't you? And it, I think with, with labels or with publishers or whatever, it's, you know, you really need to get everything in place first, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, professional people appreciate working with professional people, you know? So just, you know, present yourself well. Do, you know, I mean, it's kind of like what your mother always taught you. Use your good manners and, you know, um, make sure everything is tidy and, and, and you know, and, and do a proper presentation. And then, you know, who knows what will happen. Um, also, I think it's really important for people to be aware get your music out as far as possible like like you know the, the the longest reaching hands in the world i have been given songs that i've picked up from 
you know, the, 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 the person who cuts my hair, who said, oh, you know, I told my brother that I was going to cut your hair and his girlfriend's been writing songs and she was wondering if you would listen. Like, you don't realize how small the world is until all of a sudden things come at you from, from every side. Um, so, so really, like if you're proud of what you do, just get it out there, get it out there, because you never know who that person is, who knows somebody who's in the band, mm. who needs the song. You know, you never know how small the world is. But once it's out there, say yeah, a song goes <coughs> virally around the world, and then you come on board three months later, can you retrospectively collect royalties? Not can you can sure I, I, on, on, on a on a royalty basis for you know, and this is a, a generalization from the time something is performed in the world you have about three years okay. to be able to collect your money um, if you have like a radio hit and you haven't bothered to register it here at Emro and you just think that somebody is going to find you somehow you're really mistaken and you need to get your information in as, as, as quickly as possible and, and register it, you know, locally. So at least, you know, Imro can put out worldwide your claim on the song so that you can get, you know, some of your money, if not all of your money. Um, but, uh, you know, and then if you're doing well, let everybody know, you know, I mean, if you met somebody in a bar and, uh, and said, hey, you know, I sent you a song, and you said you weren't interested, but I've got this new song, and it's on the radio in Ireland, and now I'm going to start touring in the UK, and things are happening for me. It's like, okay, I'll listen again. You know, just remember that. Like, the doors are not closed. You know, they just need to, you know, be knocked on again. And how much does <laughs> personal taste come into it? I mean, do you Everything. hear a song and you hate a song, and you, but you know it's going to sell, or vice I, versa? You know what? I, 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 I never hate a hit. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 no. I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a big difference about what I might go home and play on my stereo at home, mm. and what I might sign or work with. You know, that's it, it's an undeniable hit. Um, but but both have room, you know. I mean, I think there's a lot of room in the world for what I call critical acclaim, you know, for just music that's so good, but it just doesn't appeal to the masses. And then there's a lot of room for, you know, people who are doing really good work that appeal to the masses. I mean, uh, we we represent David Guetta, and when we started working with David, he was a DJ who couldn't get on the radio in the U.S. You know, um, so so a lot of it is just acknowledging people who have really great talent in what they do, and you know, and hoping that in time it'll all show. And we kind of touched on it before, but you know, these various other forms of media, you know, film, you know, film placements, TV adverts, computer games, they're becoming far more important, aren't they, as, as we go along? But, well, you know, they're really helpful. Um, I, I I was. A, we were working actually with a young Irish band um, who I, I think might have sold 12,000 records in the US. I mean, they sold nothing. But, you know, because we were able to secure for them a number of television and advertisement placements, I mean, I think that's what kept their bills paid, you know, mm -hmm. because it, it certainly wasn't their record sales. Um, so, so it really does help augment something else. You know, I, I think there's a great misconception that if you have a song on, you know, on a big TV show that that's going to change your career. And I, I don't believe that. Um, I, I wish it was true because we place, you know, unknown songs on big TV mm. shows every day. But I, I still have yet to see it go like, oh, now look at that. They went from, you know, having this one song placement to being on the top of the charts. I, I haven't seen that correlation. But, you know, every, any way that you can get the music exposed to people to help get them to discover your music and what you're doing, it, it's all a step towards having a career, which I think is the goal. And what can artists do to help that? I mean, certainly you mentioned kind of independent film. I guess certainly, certainly in this country, there's, there's a great kind of independent film scene. And maybe kind of approaching directors. Yeah, I, which, which is which is which is great to do. And you know what? Um, independent directors aren't really approachable. How many people here have experience with independent film? One. Okay. Um, what you will find is if you go to a um, 
film festival, and I'm sure there's many here because we have them all over, and I give licenses for them all the time. G go, you know, go see five days of films and see what people are doing and listen to the music that they're using and approach the directors and say, hey, I have music that might work for your next project and start the relationship. I mean, these directors of independent films are exactly sitting where you're sitting right now. They're wanting their films to take that next leap and guess what? They need good music to do that. I mean, I, I, I supervised a few feature films and one of them, I think the soundtrack did better than the film did in the box office, but it was a really good soundtrack. Um, but you know, but it's 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 a great relationship to have, and once again, you don't know where it's going to go. Um, you you know, and sometimes you do get lucky. Sometimes a great film placement makes all the difference. We worked. Um, we had this uh, one song that we we have the. the we, this demo closet now. Once again, the company's 100 years old. So there's this closet filled of reel-to-reels and 45s. And I looked at it years ago, and I'm like, we don't even know what this stuff is. Like, we've never even listened to it. So um, I had the creative team digitize <coughs> the demo closet. And, uh, and then we were listening to all the songs that they recorded from these 45s. And there was one song. I'm like, oh, this is a perfect song. This song can <coughs> be used anytime, anywhere, for anything, just people need to know it exists. It's a song from the 50s. And, uh, and so back then, we were still sending CDs, now we just send drop boxes. Back then, we were sending CDs, and people call us and say, I need you know, a female torch song, I need a jazz song from 1944, I need whatever you know, they were looking for, and we would send out the supervisors the music. And so during this year, I said, okay, here's the thing, every CD that leaves the house this year, at the bottom, I don't care what they ask for, there's gonna be an asterisk and you're gonna throw on the song because people need to know that this song exists. And during that summer, over a three week period of time, we had five different requests for the song and the best one ultimately came from uh, Quentin Tarantino for the song, Kill, or for the movie Kill Bill. And um, it was performed by a girl, Japanese group called the Five Six Seven Eights in this bar scene. I don't know if you guys seen the movie, um, but the song is called Woo Hoo, and it literally has no. I mean, the lyric is Woo Hoo, Woo Hoo Hoo. I mean, there's, there's, but it, but it's that kind of like driving. It's based on the guitar boogie. By, it's just, a, it's just a great anything song, and this song, which was, I, mean, I don't know, maybe I'm being generous saying that it used to generate about a hundred dollars a year. And you know, when I made Michael, uh, the president of Shapiro Bernstein, uh, call the widow of the songwriter and say, you have to warn her because she's getting a really big royalty check and I don't want this old woman to you know, have a heart attack. You know? But also she's used to getting like this tiny little check and getting a really big fat check because that song's now been licensed, I think, for nine different feature films and advertisements worldwide. I mean, this song has gone on to have a heat where it was nothing. So you never know where your opportunities come from, and independent films can be a great source, and you never know, you know when you saddle to the right wagon, but the opportunity's there, you just have to go for it. What about video games? I and mean, that seems to be, the music seems to be playing a larger part in those. <clears throat> they do. Um, you know, but I think it kind of sucks. I wish I loved it. I wish I felt better about it. I mean, we license video games mm -hmm. all the time, um, and, and, and sometimes it's fun, you know, we, we've licensed like a lot of songs to DJ Hero and my son is playing and we're dancing, you know, but, um, you know, but I, I don't think they pay particularly well. They pay okay, but not great. And um, I, I don't really see a lot of extra movement from it. I mean, I think occasionally you get like a song that might pop, but that might be a song out of, yeah. you know, 80 on you know, a game or something. And I think that the days of a record going on, you know, a song going on a film or a TV ad and then becoming a huge hit are probably kind of gone now, aren't they? Well, like, I mean, you know, people who watch One Tree Hill aren't going to necessarily go out and then hell that spoiler. Yeah, them. I keep hoping because I put a lot of songs on that show too. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I always think 
that there's no such thing as bad exposure mm. and there's no such thing as bad performance royalties. So, you know, if you have a song that, you know, isn't doing anything and now it's generating money around the world because it's being performed around the world on a TV show, that even if that doesn't launch your career, you know, it, it is putting, you know, some, some cash in your pocket. And, um, and would you ever turn something down because you don't feel it's right for the song? Yes. And right for the artist, doesn't show me. So Grand Theft or all these kind of games. Or yeah, I mean, a, a lot of times for um, if it's if it's a very violent video game, if the songwriter is against um, being associated with extreme violence, we'll say no, thank you. Um, if it's uh, you know an advertisement for something that makes well, it, usually if it's an advertisement for anything, if the songwriter is uncomfortable with it, and I don't care if it's you know I've had songwriters say I don't want to be in the Dove commercial, I'm like. The Dove soap commercial, like that's, that's as benign as it gets. No, no, no. I don't want my music. So, all right, fine. And then, then the artists have a say in that. So yeah, well, the the, the song, I, I song, songwriter artists, but yeah, mm. the song always, always, they always have a say. You know, if it's a very public use of their music, I never, you know, once again, my job is to protect your rights, not exploit them negatively, only exploit them positively. Yeah. You know, it's like we can make people a lot of money, but if they don't want to do it for whatever reason, at the end of the day, they wrote the song, I didn't write the song. You know, it's like, I, 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 I see the payday for them doing, you know, a, a great, you know, ad for anything but no. if, 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 if they don't want it then you know it's it's a non-starter and how directly would you do an artist I mean you know I guess there are lawyers involved and all sorts of rep company people and well it depends I mean uh, once again the songwriter artist um, sometimes the songwriter we represent is also the artist yeah so we're just dealing with them directly um, sometimes the songwriter is separate from the artist. Um, in the case where it's separate from the artist, uh, we generally will go with um, permission only if it's granted by the, by, on the master side by the artist, and the record company will get that clearance. Mm -hmm. We don't have to get that clearance. I mean, and the songwriting thing, as opposed to being the artist, is, is huge, isn't it? I mean, there's so many, certainly, you know, the kind of, the, Today, great, you know, huge pop acts behind them. You know, Kathy Dennis, lots of people who were, you know, okay, middling kind of pop stars in their own right. I mean, Gary Barlow did a lot of work for. Mm -hmm. He got lucky again. So, I mean, do you th do you think plenty of people appreciate that? Maybe you know, if you if it's a musician, it's not going particularly well for you. But there's always well, another it, avenue. It, 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 I mean, once again, it just depends on where your passion is. You know, if if you're. Uh, if you're really a musician and you happen to write songs because you can't find songs that really express what you're wanting to express, mm. that's one thing. And then uh, often you're you're writing songs that are so personal that it's hard for them to be done by other people. If you're really at heart a songwriter, but you know you always kind of had a good voice and could play an instrument, and you know it was easier for you to make money doing gigs of going out and playing your own music. But that's not you know. But you don't want to tour the world. You don't want to be in the limelight. You don't mm. want to, you know. You just kind of like want to sit home and write a song and collect the paycheck. You know, I always say I think the happiness man in the world should be you know Bernie Taupin. You know, he's got all of Elton John's <laughs> money, and he can like walk into any restaurant. Nobody molests yeah. him. Nobody bothers. You know, he can like live this like really great life without having to be you know like that persona all the time which is not really for everybody um you know and i understand that i i, I certainly don't like you know being a public person so i so just you know know thyself no who are the favorite acts you've worked with over the years oh gosh <coughs> that's a really good question wow um i've worked you know i've been so blessed i i've, I've worked with so many great great talent and and over so many genres of music um oh goodness who have i really oh, it's, a, it's a great question i i don't even know where to begin um i guess there's you know there's certain people that you work with from their infancy that you know you feel mm. like a, a kind of motherly thing about um and i and i feel that way you know um I remember going to this, you know, impoverished songwriter, you know, potluck spaghetti dinner where they would pass the guitar and they would each play a song and complain about how they were never going to get a record deal. And mm -hmm. I listened to them playing their songs and I was looking at them going, 
Sean Colvin, I'll get you a record deal. I'll get you a record deal, you know, and being able, and then watching them win Grammys yeah. and get, you know, recognized. Um, so I, I don't, you know, once again, my career's been too long. And, and I forget, I had a phone call last week from a man who's writing a biography about a band called The Replacements. And he's like, he's like, all right, so, you know, Tommy Stinson and uh, Paul Westerberg said to call you because you'll remember when they did this or what. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like, that was 20. Why would I remember? Like, I don't remember. I hardly remember yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Every, and it, I mean, to some degree, I'm like a songwriter. You know, your favorite songwriter is the one that you're working with today. So, you know, I, I happen to work with, always, I've worked with great songwriters. I've worked with a lot of, you know, uh, some great Irish songwriters. And I mean, it was really satisfying for me. We worked with a young girl from here in Dublin. And I was able to go to her 21st birthday party and present her with her first American gold record at her 21st birthday party. So, you know, it's, it, it, it could be anybody. Um, I, I'm sorry not to give a satisfying <laughs> answer to that. And so how do you, and how does your relationship with an organization like IMRO work? I know you're kind of on this whistle-stop European tour, so. Yeah, well, you know, um, it, 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 it's, it's great, first of all, uh, you know, I mean, the guys here at Emory are, are, are fabulous to work with, as, as most of you probably know, and they're really big advocates of the music, which is lovely. Um, and um, it's, it, it, it's a lot less bureaucratic than a lot of the societies I work with, where you have to, like, heaven forbid, you don't have the stamp and your signature and a nice note inquiring about their health, they'll send you your papers back, you know. Um, so, so it's a lot easier to work here with IMRO in, um, in certain respects. And like anything else, when you work with a large catalog, and I mean, we only have a catalog of about 9,000 works that generate money every year, which is small compared to big catalogs, but manageable for us. But with any of that, there's always going to be like, this piece of information is wrong, this needs to be changed, this, you know, I'm right, working right now with a wonderful composer who uses a pseudonym that has been linked worldwide with a composer of a similar name who's French, who's now getting my, my guy's money. And so I'm sitting there around the world going, okay, I, you see these films, this was written by my guy, not that guy. Can we get this changed so he can get the money? So a, a lot of what I do is really glamorous like that. Um, <laughs> well, one of your songs comes on the radio. Do you get a little kind of a... Oh, I always get happy when my songs are on the radio. Every, you know what? And, and, it's so, and it's so unexpected. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Madrid yesterday and um, heard... Uh, a, an old song we represent, Pick Yourself Up in a restaurant, in a Chinese restaurant in Madrid. And I'm like, oh, isn't this really fabulous and unexpected? Um, and uh, no, it's, it's always good to hear your songs. And we, you know, my, my son teases me because as soon as, you know, uh, and uh, granted, we're lucky, our songs are on the radio quite a bit. But every time they're on, he just knows, just, you know, crank it out. It's like, yeah, I want to hear my song loud. But. And it, radio, radio is still very important, isn't it? I mean, certainly radio for, is for very reaching kind of a new audience. And radio is very important because, I mean, as, as great as the internet is, the internet has an expectation that you are going to spend a lot of time seeking out mm. things that you are interested in. Guess what? The radio is kind of on everywhere. The radio makes it easy for you. You know, you flip the dial, you, you, know, you choose a station, and it's feeding you stuff. If you like it or you don't on any given song, but at least you don't really have to do the work. Um, so, so the radio, and you know, the radio is, is also a a great tool for you know deciding you know public opinion. I mean, if if everybody hated it, it would be on the radio. And so, where do you think we're heading in the next five years? What's going to be the? Can you see any kind of trends coming up? Or oh, that's that's a really good question. Um, trends over the next five years. You know, it's it's funny. I always say that people people have teased me for years about how I'm into music early and I'm not really into music early, I'm just bored early. So like I was, you know, I, I had done a lot of work in the um, alternative rock, you know, like grunge era. And I remember being at a showcase that we put on when I was at ASCAP in Seattle of 
it was a cool showcase. It was these bands, uh, Hungry Crocodiles, Best Kissers in the World, and Pearl Jam. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the industry is all over this now. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I need something new. And this guy approached me. He's like, you know, we have some R&B here. I'm like, you have R&B in Seattle? He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm working with this guy. Can you come talk to him? His name's Sir Mixel. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that's how I ended up signing Mix. Yeah. Was, you know, so, so sometimes it's just that I get like bored with what's happening a little before everybody else does. Do you think the industry's then a little bit too obsessed with what, you know, because especially this year there's been, you know, the Nirvana reissues, what the U2 one coming out, you know, there's a lot of looking back, isn't there? Well, I think the industry likes to look back because it's very profitable, you know. It doesn't really cost a lot of money to reissue a record. And it always, you know, looks to the fact that people are nostalgic for something that they were young with. I was with a songwriter last week in London, and uh, I love this man, and he wrote um, the music for uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and which I know every word to. And so I'm like, oh, he's like, Which yeah. The, the original. The original, the original. Okay. He's like, he's like, he's, you know, so he wrote like The Candy Man and Pure Man. I mean, great songs, great songwriter. And, uh, and, and so he's like, oh, well, they're about to do this big push for like the 40th anniversary. I'm like, cool, I'm all <laughs> over it because, you know, I was a child when that came out and that has like soft places for me. Um, which is not any different than when they do an Elvis reissue or a Beatles reissue or, you know, things that, you know, every generation has their own soft spots for music. You think that the art of writing that kind of song is still prevalent, you know, writing one song that can just go across the board and reach everyone? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I had the... It, 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 was, it, was, it was cute when we were listening to the songs that David Guetta had worked on with the Black Eyed Peas. Um, you know, the kids on my staff were like, oh, we love Rock That Body. I'm like, yes, I understand why you like Rock That Body. But I got a feeling is money, and mama likes money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this is a song that we can use everywhere. And mm -hmm. it's a song that, you know, I mean, it was 14 weeks at number one in the US, and it was everywhere in the world, and it appealed to old people and young people and R&B and pop, and you know, it was just like one of those songs that kind of became a mainstay for every wedding, every celebration, you know, it's, it's, it's now <coughs> part of the culture, and people always say, oh, those kind of songs aren't written anymore. It's like, well, they are. They might sound a little different, but they still are. Do you remember the first time you heard that song? I do. Because I was, I was standing, I was standing there at uh, Alexa at my office desk, and she mm -hmm. had the CD, and we were listening to the the, and that's when you know, and 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 that's when I made the comment. It's like, that's that's the money song. And they're like, really? I'm like, really? You're not bored of it yet? No, it's exciting. You know what? Every every no, you ne you never get bored of it because, especially when you know the people behind it, and it's not just David. I mean, David co-wrote that song with another writer we represent named Fred Rister, and Fred is like the loveliest man you can ever meet. And so when you know these people, especially like the Freds of the world, the people who are very much in the background, who are not the public face, who don't get the accolade but have talent, 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 that makes you excited. It makes you happy that you know that they have success doing something they love. Great, well, I think we'll open up to the floor before we get into the demo. Has anybody got any questions? What, what, the house, what happens if it, they, they'll come to us and say, this is what I'm trying to do, here's the recording that I've made of it, please let me know whether or not I have your permission. Um, and then we'll go through it and tell them if it's okay and what they need to do about you know, I mean, because it, it could be like, it could be any scenario. I mean, we have a, a disco classic called um, Let the Music Play. And um, last year, year and a half ago, I guess, uh, Jordan Sparks <coughs> did a new version um, where they basically used Let the Music Play, but they put some new lyrics on it, they put some changes on it. And so then we negotiated with the new songwriters and we gave them a piece of the SOS uh, song, let the music play. So, you know, it all depends on what you're doing. Case um, by case. Is it, it is totally case by case. I mean, sometimes if people are just completely butchering it, you know, it's like it, you can only do so much to protect people from themselves. So you're like, no, please don't do this. Yeah, okay. So does sampling come into your room as well? Absolutely. Every, every Which is day. Now the, the, yeah, that's 
probably more Every of a day. headache than anything else. It's such a big headache. You know, a lot of a lot of the contemporary music we work in is a really, really big headache because, you know, I mean, we look at songs sometimes and there'll be, you know, 17 writers. And it's like, really? You know what this means? Nobody's going to make a penny. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, once the song is like divvied up into these thin slices because there's so many samples cleared and so many people participating, it's it gets kind and of crazy. And so just no matter how much of a song is in there, once it's in there, it's, is it the same royalty or? No, it's, it's, you know what, it's all negotiable. If you're, it's, if it's a sample, it has to, you have to get permission for it. Um, and in getting permission for it, you know, the song that you sample can take anything from zero to 100% of your new song. So it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's all a big headache. No, actually, I used to tour manage, you know, you know Gilbert Sullivan? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, very, yeah. very, very, very famous Kate. But that was Bismarcky, wasn't it? And that yeah, was Bismarcky. The the, that's, that's the big sampling case. They pulled the records off the shelf of Bismarcky because he, he was denied permission yeah. to use Gilbert Sullivan. Personally, I don't have a preference. I think, um, once again, it's whatever you think gets the song across the best. If it's the kind of song that is going to be completely moving with just a piano vocal demo, then send that if you think it's gonna get too cluttered by having too much stuff on it. If you think, you know, if, if, if you send and say, and imagine the beak break here, and you don't, you know, it's like, okay, that's not gonna happen. So, you know, just to, to, to send, you know, something that you think is really representative. I worked with a songwriter once based on a demo that he had sent me that he recorded with his <coughs> child's like, kid and play Fisher Price cassette deck. He's like, oh, it's all I had. I'm like, it's okay, it's an amazing song and you got your point across. Um, so, so it's really, I mean, uh, I, I'm not a record company, you know, I don't have to have like the delivered finished product, but I, I do need to know exactly what you're thinking. And, um, and it's funny because another way that the business has changed is we license a lot of what I would consider to be demos. You know, a lot because the state of home recording has elevated so much that these recordings sound really good. We license to a lot of TV shows a demo, and and we'll license both the master and 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 the sync. And granted, you know they don't get you know the kind of money I wish they did, but still, you know the opportunity is there if it if it sounds good enough that I can present it to somebody you know in a raw form. That's good. Well, that's a, uh, well, you know, the best deal is, um, unfortunately, the best deal for you, you know, and, um, and, and that's not necessarily about the numbers. It's not about the advance. It's not about the percentage. It's about, you know, who do you feel the best about working with? You know, if you call them, is there going to be a human person who answers the phone? If your person who's the contact of the company leaves the company, are there other people at the company who care about your music? No, 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 because it depends. I mean, it, there's, you know, if you're doing a co-publishing deal, it's different than if you're doing an administration deal. If you have, you know, something of note that somebody really wants, it's going to demand a different deal than something that's purely speculation. Where, you know, if a publisher is just investing all their time trying to make you happen versus you have something that's happening and they're trying to latch on to that. Um, so no, it really, it, it, it really, it really depends. But, you know, do, do a lot of research take a little time, not a lot of time. I mean, don't, you know, don't drag people out. If there's people you know you absolutely don't want to do business with, just tell them that you're not interested in, and move on. You, you could get a reversion 
I mean, once again, it, it all just depends on who you're dealing with. And, and what I, I mean, I, I, I wish I could say that it's always like this, but it's not, you know. I mean, some people will, you know, will do a deal with you for a year. Some people will just want two songs. Some people want everything you write for the rest of your life and what your children write. I mean, you know, it, it could be anything. So you just really... You know, make sure that you just you you deal with a comfortable a company that you're really comfortable with, and have very good understanding with. I mean, there's a big difference between a multinational company and an independent company. There's a big difference between an independent company who is secure and you know independent companies who are controlled by banks or venture capitalist groups. You know, I mean, you just you need this is this is hopefully money that you'll be getting for the rest of your life. So you just need to feel good about the deals that you do with it. Mm. There's um, publications called like A&R 411. There's publications that you can purchase that will tell you, give you a guide to everybody who's in the business and names and contacts and, and, and give you a, a good starting point as to where to go. You'd be. You'd also be really good to look to your. Um, in the U.S., as you know, you have your choice of performing rights organizations. So you make your choice on if you want your songs to be with ASCAP or with BMI or with CSAC. You know, I would really recommend that whatever choice you made. I mean, if you decided to be with ASCAP call the ASCAP office, they have one in London, and say, listen, I'm looking for a publisher in the US, Can you? Get, here's my music, can you give me the names of some people you think would be appropriate for me? And they'll, they'll give you reputable people. No, we don't usually work like that. I mean, our creative team um, is really, um, we, we don't do a whole lot of a r by internet. We do most of it by submission or by um, word of mouth, you know. I mean, if somebody tells us we should listen to something or look up something, you know, and it's, and it's a credible source, um, so we, we look to that. But we don't usually just kind of, I mean, if you really just try to go on to YouTube and listen to, you know, random things, you would want to put a bullet in your brain. I mean, there's so much yeah, dreck yeah. out there. It's really, it's not a great use of time to try to do um, sourcing that way. Um, and I think like, you know, record companies might have junior people who do things like that, but we're too small of a company. But there's so much good music out there that, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much for, for, for lack of it. You know, and, and I always so recommend as much as possible Write and co-write with as many people as you can. Um, one of my best A and R sources are my songwriters, who like write something with somebody else, and I'll be like, "Ooh, that's really good!" And like, "Yeah, the guy's really talented." I'm like, "I want to meet him too," you know. So they're they're always really good sources, and you know, you never know where songwriters find each other, but. I think we do not as a policy select, um, but getting it solicited is not usually more difficult than to send a very polite email or letter addressed to a person saying, hey, you know, hey, Debbie, can I send you a song? And I'll be like, okay, you can send me. And now you are not unsolicited. So I wouldn't have to go through a lawyer to get it? No, I mean, you know, you, you, you could go through a lawyer, you could go through an, a producer, you could go through anybody. Okay. But, um, but you know, you could also just come directly and just ask. Okay, sure. And, <coughs> you know, as long as we get the sense that you're not totally out of your mind, you know, just slightly <laughs> out of your mind, it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm skeptical, and granted, I know I'm a little old, and I do things kind of old school, but I'm skeptical about ever giving away your rights, which is your birthright. I mean, this is something that, the, this is your talents to somebody who you can't look in the eyes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, to things that are unknown. Like, you know, it sounds good in the void. Oh, yeah, we'll do this and we'll do these rights and then we'll own this. But it's like, you know what? I, I think at the end of the day, you're so much better served if you work with somebody who is actually your advocate. And if you don't have that person, then you're better off, you know, continuing to bang down the doors yourself and find the opportunities yourself. Um, you know, it's it's really like if you read the trades, you get an idea as to who's going to be putting out a new record. We just got a outside cut on the new Westlife Christmas record or Greatest Hits record or something, even though it's a new song. You know, I mean, outside cuts can be had, but you just kind of have to pay attention. I think that's fine, but you know, you could also do a, a, you know, go a step further. And if you write a song that you think, oh God, this is so One Tree Hill, guess what? On the episode of One Tree Hill, it says music supervisor and it has a name on it. Mm -hmm. That name is researchable. You can like find that person, email that person, and say, you know, I know I'm in Dublin, but I watch One Tree Hill and my music would fit. And would you just take a listen to one track and tell me I'm out of my mind? And, and you know, and guess what? Music supervisors are, they love, they love getting music from people like you who might have something that's really great and it won't cost them nearly as much as it will if they go to me you know i mean they, they love being able to get new music first and you know and something that works for what they're doing and you know so so approach them is there a danger then people start writing to sound like they can go on the well you never want to you know i mean i think as a songwriter you never want to do something that is not you. I mean, you don't want to present something that's disingenuous. I mean, why would you do that? Just because you think it's popular at the moment, it's going to come off as being fake. fake. So, you know, you, but if you find that what you do is, you know, right in pocket with something that's going on, then there's no reason why not to. It'll be after you've written it, okay. Yeah, it's like, oh gosh, you know, I've written this record and it sounds kind of on this ilk and that seems what they keep using you know